Hi, my name is Steve Guttenberg, and I'm an audiophile. And I say it that way because a lot of audiophiles don't admit that they're audiophiles. They, they say, I'm a music lover. Well, I'm a music lover too, but I'm, I think I'm an audiophile first. And, and it actually started to happen to me when I was about 10 years old, and my parents bought a Wurlitzer jukebox, and it was in the basement of our house and the floor was a black and white checker floor and I used to go there pick tunes to play and lay on the floor and just feel this music coming over me and it was my hi-fi that was my first hi-fi was this giant uh, Wurlitzer with yellow and green lights and bubbles going through the tubes and everything and I was mesmerized by the machine. It wasn't just the sound. It was the, it was the way the machine worked, the mechanism of the turntable in it. It just enthralled me. So it was the music, but it was actually the sound of the music. It was the way the music made me feel that was the main deal of listening to it. And I still feel that way. When I listen to music, the music is important but it's the sound of the music that, that gets to me. You know, you can listen to music over anything, over a car radio or a little Bluetooth speaker, but the way the, the system sounds is, is a big deal. And then I realized that it wasn't just me that was obsessed with sound. The people that made records were obsessed with sound. And this was, like one of my early records was um, Link Ray's rumble which was one of the first records that used intentional distortion on guitar and it it just spoke to me i just felt like yeah that's the way it should be i mean the sound of an acoustic guitar is nice but the sound of link ray's distorted guitar was something else something that didn't really exist in nature it was his own thing a new sound that had never been heard on planet earth before link ray made that sound I mean, probably other guitar players made that sound, but the first time it was on a record intentionally. So it was really the sound of music that, <clears throat> that really got to me. And it wasn't just me, it was the people who, make, who made records. Phil Spector uh, made these records with what he called the wall of sound, which again was something that didn't exist until he created it, where she had multiple instruments playing the same sound. So like three guitars playing in unison, three pianos, four bass players, everybody playing and just purposely blending all that sound together. And when I heard that <clears throat> out of the jukebox, out of the Wurlitzer, it, it really, um, it moved me. And then I realized it's other people are not like me. They're not listening to the sound of music. They're listening to the music. They're listening to the melody and the tempo and the sound, but they don't hear the sound the way I do. And I think that's what separates audiophiles from everybody else, is that they care about what something sounds like. So it matters to them in ways that it doesn't matter to other people. Um, so I bought my first hi-fi of my own when I was 16 years old, and I would sit in my room and sometimes I would do the thing that a lot of people figured out on their own where they put speakers on either side of their head and they just get immersed in the sound. And I did that from time to time when I got a, a new record that really grabbed me. I would definitely do that. Then moving forward a little bit, I wound up in 1978 meeting Andy Singer and working in a hi-fi store. And uh, when Andy started, this is in New York City. He actually started the store in his mother's living room. His mother had this great apartment on 68th Street. It was a big place and it was a very large living room. And he basically, it kind of looked like my room does now, but, but more so, he had so much hi-fi in there. And the thing that amazed me in those early days was not just the equipment, but that the people in the industry. When I met Dan D'Agostino from Krell and Peter Snell from Snell, and all these people, I was like, we're on the same wavelength. They're just like me. They think about sound. They love music, but it's the sound of it, how it's being reproduced. And basically, I have to keep coming back to this, it's how it makes you feel. That is the whole bottom line. If you're not feeling it, it doesn't matter. 
but being immersed in in that for 16 years that I worked for for Andy was an amazing education and just having so many experiences was so much hi-fi the, the other thing that's interesting is a lot of audiophiles deny the fact that it is about the stuff it's about the gear it's about the way it looks, the way it feels, the mystique behind it, the people who design it, all of that stuff is part of the, the, the audiophile mindset. It's how at least some of us think. Some of us deny it, but in fact, to some degree, it is about the gear. And then I started working for David Chesky in 1989, making records with him. It's, it's when he started making records, because before that, uh, Chesky Records was just a reissue label for Living Stereo LPs. But uh, in 1989, I started making records first with Johnny Frigo and Clark Terry and Phil Woods, a bunch of those records. And David's whole approach was to capture the sound exactly as it appeared before the microphone. The sound was supposed to capture the band as they were in the studio. This was RCA Studio A on 46th Street, a great old studio that exists no more. And being in that environment of trying to make records that sound exactly like what it sounded when the band played was, a, it was so much fun. We would go back and forth between the control room, listen to the sound coming out of the speakers, go into the hall, listen to the band play, come back, do this back and forth thing, and just refine it. Now, of course, most records are not like that. That's the one percent that. Uh, that's the one percent that try to make records that sound like the actual band. Most recordings are highly processed, EQ'd, reverbed, everything that goes into them. There's not a lot, necessarily, of what actually happened when the band played. So I was never the kind of reviewer who was interested in approaching perfection. I like different kinds of sounds coming from speakers. I have I personally own uh, Zoo speakers, I have Magnapan speakers, I'm currently using TAD speakers, I, I have also B&W 805 speakers. I have a lot of speakers and they all sound different and I like them for different reasons. I sometimes think that audiophiles come to this hobby with a uh, it's almost like a belief system. They believe that analog is better than digital, or digital is better than analog, or that tubes sound better, more natural than solid state, or the other way around, or that horn speakers are better than electrostatic speakers. And I mean, some guys move back and forth between them, but they tend to be, some people tend to be stuck in one camp or the other and put down the opposite side. So, you know, one of the things I worry about, though, that so much high-end audio is so expensive, and yet, at the, the other end, the entry-level stuff has never been better. There's so many great things. I mean, for the $100 Audio-Technica uh, ATLP60 turntable is amazingly good. Does it sound like a $1,000 turntable? No. But it, for what it is, as they say, it's really exceptional. Shit Audio uh, in California makes great headphone amps and DACs and they just started to make preamps and they're going to have a power amp soon. They're all made in the United States and they're all affordable. The NAD C316 BEE integrated amp is killer. I'm constantly surprised by how good it is. I just reviewed the Emotiva Base X A100 50 watt channel amplifier that's incredible. It's $229. The Pioneer uh, SPBS22LR speakers are $129 a pair. They were designed by Andrew Jones. Killer for the money. There has never been anything better for $129. So there's lots of really good affordable audio out there. So no one should ever feel that they can't afford to get into this. So headphones are another area that's just really exciting. I mean, it's been exciting for me since 2007 when Odyssey and Hi-Fi Man brought out the first modern day planar magnetic headphones that were a giant leap forward over everything else that was out, out at that time. And now, in the last few years, some in-ear headphones 
from Odyssey, again, making the first planar magnetic in-ear headphone. Um, Stax made the first electrostatic in-ear headphone that John Atkinson really likes. Um, there's a new AudioQuest headphone, in-ear headphone coming that I'm really excited about. Um, of course, there's always full-size Grados that are amazing, Audio Technicas, Fostex, the list goes on and on and on. But headphones are also a great way to get into high-end audio without spending obscene amount, without spending obscene amounts of money. My method of reviewing is basically to live with the product, whether it's a speaker, or an amplifier, a cable, whatever. Just put it in my system and listen to it without judging it. And I spend some time just living with it. You know, do I like it? Am I having a good time listening to it? But I don't really take any notes for, for a while. And then I'll actually put something else in that's close in size and price to that thing and compare it A to B. Like, is the product I'm reviewing better, different, louder, softer? How, how those two things compare at that point, I'm taking notes and evaluating and being critical, what I like and what I don't like. But it's a very much, really, for me, uh, an emotional thing. Like, am I enjoying this product? Not does it have too much bass or too little bass or too much treble or not enough treble or is it transparent or how does it image? That, that comes later. That's like in the final part of, of, of writing something up. It's more about how it makes me feel. That is the most important thing. And of course, I do have the advantage of having listened to so much stuff in my life, working at Sound by Singer for 16 years, reviewing for almost 20 years. I've probably seriously listened to probably a thousand pairs of speakers. Um, so I just call upon all of that experience. And also the experience of knowing the people in the industry and what their goals are in, in designing a product. So my method is not specific, it's not scientific, there's not a checklist or anything other than what I just described to you. It's, it's an emotional trip and I try to make it interesting because I have to. I'm driven to find the cool, interesting aspect of a product. What is it that would make you sit up and take notice? And hopefully there is something. <laughs> Usually there is. So there's something I have to dig sometimes to find it but usually there's something special, unique about a product that makes me want to review it.